Good morning. Um, my name is Suniva O'Flynn and I work in the Irish Film Institute and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our third session for IFI Spotlight 2021. Uh, some of you may have had uh, the pleasure of engaging with us over the past couple of weeks as we've explored uh, gender and diversity and inclusion uh, in Ireland and in more global contexts. Um, we began with a presentation from the United States and last week we had a series of presentations from the UK. So we were looking to others to see how their models for development of policy around diversion and inclusion were progressing. And today we are in Ireland and uh, we're looking to our own situation. Ireland, it goes without saying, uh, has undergone seismic shifts in the demography over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and it is our job as cultural makers and responders and uh, observers to, to, to match those changes and to, to see how we can respond adequately to the changes in society so that the work that is being produced is reflective of the society that we live in. Um, the, 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 creation of a, a more permeable uh, society where, where people have access to the institutions uh, that make work and are responsible for policy making and so on uh, will require a paradigm shift from uh, makers and society and, and uh, institutions. And we're pleased with Spotlight to be part of that conversation, uh, to be part of a process of uh, changing awareness of uh, exclusions and to, to help people to be more aware of where the gaps are in, in what we provide. Um, we, today's session, uh, we will have uh, Maureen Canelli from the Arts Council, Stephanie Comey from the BAI, Sandrine the Hero from uh, University of Limerick, and Les Leslie McKim from Screen Ireland to speak about um, policies in Ireland, to speak about experience in Ireland, to speak about gaps and absences. Our, our panel is by no means representative of all uh, minority groups, of all those who have been underrepresented thus far, but it comprises people who have been paying attention to those absences and are working to address inequity in, in provision, uh, both in, uh, in, in creation of work, in providing access to work and in funding that work. So I think it's a really strong panel, each of whom will have uh, interesting things to say. Um, they are being minded today. They are being steered in their deliberations by Sheila de Courcy. Um, Sheila uh, is our moderator. Uh, she's a person who has had a very varied and colourful career, which has involved everything from being a housemaid and street sweeper to uh, a conservator in the National Museum of Ireland. She spent over 30 years producing, directing and commissioning all kinds of radio, television and online material for RTE. And long before smartphones had made broadcast available to so many people, Sheila's passion for participation by everyone in mainstream media was central to her work. She sought voices and stories which might not otherwise be seen on screen and developed a range of accessible strands. She was group head of children's and controller of RTE Junior. Um, and as in that position, Sheila was responsible for setting up RTE's third channel, Channel 4 Children. And from the start, inclusive, inclusivity was at the heart of this channel. And the core mission was to explore and reflect the world in which youngsters in Ireland find themselves. She's had a long commitment to media education and mentoring and has produced and participated in workshops, seminars and conferences, and has done time on boards of the ARC, a cultural center for children, the Dublin International Chamber of Commerce, and yes, the IFI, where she's currently a board member. So I'm delighted to welcome you all to all of our audience, and of course, to the Arts Council, represented here in the person of Maureen Kennelly, but as our key funders, uh, we're, we're constantly uh, grateful to the, the Arts Council for allowing us to proceed with our work. Hey, over to you, Sheila. Thanks a million, Sneef, and that's a great introduction. Uh, it's great to, that I, people are here, um, both on screen and off screen, discussing this. Inclusivity is very, very uh, important. I have to correct, Sneva, one thing. I know nothing about commerce. You mentioned that I was on the Dublin International Chamber of Commerce, or I have, I know nothing about it, despite being a producer all my life. It's the Dublin International Chamber Music Festival that I'm on the board of. So that's a shout out for, for, for them. But anyway, moving on from there, you know, and I only correct that because I know nothing about commerce, but all these guys do, because we've got a lot of funding um, issues to talk about and leadership and direction. Um, 
So here we go. Maureen Kennelly. You're very welcome, Maureen. And Maureen was the Director of Poetry Ireland from 2013 until she commenced her role as Director of the Arts Council in April 2020. Maureen was previously Director of the Kilkenny Arts Festival, Artistic Director of the Mermaid Arts Centre, General Manager with Fish Amble Theatre Company, and she also worked with Druid Theatre Company, the Cat Laughs Comedy Festival, the Arts Council, and the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland. It's fantastic. On a freelance basis, Maureen worked with a wide range of organisations, including Theatre Forum, Sing Ireland, the Performance Corporation, and Age and Opportunity. She was primary curator with the Mountains to See, the Mary Rathdown Book Festival, and the programme director with the Courch International Festival of Literature. Thanks for coming, Maureen. Sandrine Uwazi Dahiro is an English PhD student in the University of Limerick. Sandrine's research centres on third generation African writers, such as Afrofuturists, who have emerged during the era of late liberalism and who have introduced multiple and nuanced perspectives for reflecting on African lives and aspirations. Sandrine co-produced a documentary entitled Unsilencing Black Voices, which details personal stories and accounts by members of the Black community in Ireland. She is currently an artist in residence in Visual Carlo, where her project looks at Irishness from a localised setting. Sandrine is also the co-founder and co-editor-in-chief of a new online magazine called Unapologetic. Unapologetic is a multidisciplinary, literary, cultural and artistic response to the social issues and creative opportunities of contemporary Ireland, offering a reboot and upheaval. It's worth looking them up on Twitter and maybe getting involved. Leslie McKim has worked in the film and TV industry for 25 years, 21 years of that as a producer. For the past five years, she has been a project manager with Screen Ireland and has been across a wide range of productions, including herself, The Bright Side, Extraordinary, the Hole in the Ground, Fantasy Ireland, and the documentaries The Eighth, Shooting the Mafia, Katie, and Breaking Out. Prior to that, she was a producer with Newgrange Pictures and Comet Films, working across feature film, TV, drama, and documentary. Selected credits include My Name is Emily, Happy Ever Afters, The Documentary is Not Yet Dark, Designing Ireland for RTE, the TV drama series Whistleblower, and No Tears with Little Bird for RTE, and the international co-productions The King's Choice, The Last King, Call Girl, and A Thousand Times Good Night. And finally, on our brilliant panel, we have Stephanie Comey. She's a senior manager with the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. She joined the authority in 2003 and has since overseen a number of broadcasting policy development and regulatory areas. Currently, she has responsibility for media literacy, gender, diversity and sectoral development. She is co-chair of the Irish Media Literacy Network called Media Literacy Ireland, which she helped set up. She is also a co-chair for the European Regulatory Group on Media Literacy and a member of the European Platform for Regulators of Audiovisual Media Literacy Task Force. She contributed to the drafting of the Council of Europe recommendation on gender equality in the audiovisual sector in 2017 and has led the work of the BAI to increase women's representation and participation in media. Stephanie has worked with key stakeholders to increase the availability and quality learning and development initiatives in the media sector, supporting the establishment of industry bodies and representative networks. She holds degrees in law and English from the University of Le Havre in France, an MA in the University of Westminster, an M Social Science with the University of Leicester, and she's currently reading for a PhD in Media Studies in the Technological University of Dublin. What a lineup, I have to say. Extraordinary. There's an extraordinary body of work represented in those CVs, and I'm quite sure that they are only the tip of the iceberg. We all know that behind that lies so much more in terms of our experience of life, our experience of the way that we encounter the world and, uh, and our kind of philosophies and evolving philosophies. And so we're going to, what we're going to do folks is we're going to each, each of our panelists is going to talk with you about their area of work in relation to kind of past, present and a little bit about future. Then we're going to, once they finish, we're going to go on to a general conversation and we welcome any questions that you have. Um, the broad areas, we're essentially talking about inclusivity. How do we get there? Where are we? What has happened in the past? Where are we going? And mostly looking to the future. So to see where we are now and how we can build in this. I think looking back 
possibly is something that all, all of us at the moment, having been through such a difficult 15 months, what we really want is to, is to collectively draw our strength together and move into the present and move to the future. And so that's where I propose that we will look at most of the conversations today. Um, so let's start with Maureen. Maureen, and you're all very welcome. Everybody out there and on my screen, all very welcome. And thank you all for coming along. Maureen, we'll start with you. Sure. Great. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here this morning. And thanks so much to Suneev and to Francis and to everybody at the IFI for all your great work. And thanks, Sheila, for such a lovely intro. So I'm just going to take a few minutes um, to look at maybe certain areas that we've worked on, look at a little bit of the future. So, um, and I've prepared some notes, but I'm happy to obviously discuss later. So I think that the pandemic has caused us to have a, a great new awareness of people's aspirations and expectations for, for life. Society is now certainly more porous, or to use Geneva's term, permeable. There's been far more collaboration in the last 16 months. There's a greater sense of how we can work together to build a better society, to improve all of our lives. And I feel very strongly that we're not now saddled with the certainties of the past that I have a strong feeling that, you know, everything is up for grabs like never before. I recently read these lines from a Canadian educator, George Day, when he said, inclusion is not about bringing people into what already exists. It is about creating a new space, a better space for everyone. And I think that this is exactly what we need to do. Our work is not about bolting on to what already exists because what, because what exists is certainly not perfect. It's about us recognizing the need for radical change. And it's about us waking up every single day with these thoughts in our head that over 17% of our population identify as something other than white Irish. Over half a million people in Ireland live with a disability. And one in six people in Ireland live in poverty, including almost a quarter of a million children. And these thoughts must inform everything that we do. How do we make sure that we can achieve an arts landscape that is truly reflective of this picture of Ireland? And the pandemic, of course, has shown us how vulnerable certain communities are. So how do we make sure that the gap doesn't get even wider and that those who were left behind before are not even further distanced. How can we stop ourselves rolling backwards? We must always be aware of all the people who have been sidelined or discouraged or diminished or dissuaded along the way. We've missed out on so much already because so many people have not been part of the conversation. So I wanted to mention a little bit about our spatial policy, <clears throat> which we'll be launching in coming weeks. We set out as our vision in that, that it's for a country where everyone has the opportunity to create, engage with, participate in, and enjoy the arts and culture, regardless of who they are or where they live and work. And it's no accident nor surprise to me that uh, my colleague Monica Corkery Corcoran has been leading out in this policy. Monica has also laid out, along with other colleagues, on our equality, human rights and diversity and the values of inclusion sing out in this policy. And we must make sure that the initiatives we support have an enduring societal impact and that inclusion and diversity are at the heart of each artistic choice made by the organisations which we support. So just to touch a little bit then on our equality, human rights and diversity policy, it's very active. It seeks to uphold the public sector duty and to show leadership to the arts sector in striving for greater equality of access, opportunities and outcomes in Ireland today. Our first action plan will conclude in March 2022 and it has actively sought to improve representation and inclusion across all our structures and systems, including our board, our staff our, and our, our artistic community and our peer panel participants. And I'm pleased to say that we now have two board members who have lived experience in terms of cultural diversity and who are fantastic contributors to, to the work of the Arts Council. In terms of our recruitment, we're very much focusing on underrepresented communities in our recruitment campaigns. And shortly we will be appointing 
a very a brand new post of head of equality, diversity and inclusion, and that is a seismic moment for our organization. It's extremely exciting. And in terms of our peer panel, we have recently had a call, as many of you will know, to to widen um, the representation on on our peer panels. And we've had a very, very good response to that. So we look forward to informing you about good news on that score in, in the near future. But additionally, there are a number of new measures that we are taking and have taken to widen and increase the accessibility of mainstream award opportunities for artists. They include expanded and enhanced access accessibility support. So there is real financial support there to available to applicants for across all awards. We're taking proactive steps to encourage new applicants to individual awards. As I mentioned, we want better representation on all our assessment panels. We are embedding equality, diversity and inclusion as a core criterion in all funding programs. So that we now have a dedicated assessment criterion and against which organizations will be measured in these funding programs from this year on. So it's very important for me to emphasize today that organizations will be scored on that. And we are developing a toolkit with and for this sector to support them in developing their equality, diversity and inclusion work. So we'll be unveiling that in coming months. And uh, we've had super engagement from a very wide range of people in developing that toolkit. So again, that's something that we're extremely excited about. In terms of gender balance on boards, lots of really good work has been done on that. And I think the, the statistic is now that 52% of chair persons are are male 48 percent female so lots lots of good work has been done there i just wanted to mention as well that uh, we we fund arts and disability ireland as a strategic organization and work extremely closely with them so we want to work with them in terms of developing arts and disability capacity in the wider arts sector so Many people on the call and yourselves in the IFI will know about the very successful IFI Access Film Initiative um, and that grew out of a pilot initiative between the IFI, Arts and Disability Ireland and ourselves in the Arts Council. So as part of the work with, with Arts and Disability Ireland, we're looking at dis disability equality training for artists, arts organisations and venues. A number of access audits on venues have been conducted. These are really important and investment in the Arts and Disability Connect scheme, and that's delivered on our behalf by Arts and Disability, Arts and Disability Ireland. The budget's increased sixfold since the scheme began. Now, I have to say that that's from a low base of 25,000 euros in 2014, but I'm happy to say that this year it's 150,000 euros. So we'll, we look forward to our continued work with Arts and Disability Ireland. In the past, I think pandemics have changed the contours of human life and the shared threat of COVID-19 is accelerating our, our understanding of how we can improve the world for future generations. And I honestly believe that within our grasp now is the opportunity to create a space, a new space that George Day spoke about, that new space, to make a civic force field of artistic activity to energize and cohere the nation. And that force field must comprise appropriately paid artists from all backgrounds, delivering work of the highest quality to the widest possible public. And I think we're, we're on the cusp of a very exciting new dawn. I just want to finally conclude by thanking my colleagues, Monica Corcoran, whom I already mentioned, Anne O'Connor and Fanula Sweeney for helping me shape my thinking towards today. So look forward to hearing the other contributions. Thank you. Terrific, Maureen, and very, very gives a lot of hope. It's a very good start. Can I just ask you one question? Because I know that the um, Equality, Human Rights and Diversity strategy predated your appointment as uh, head of the Arts Council. I'm just curious, has it been hard to implement it? I mean, it's a very, very ambitious um, strategy, but from what you're saying, it's made good progress. It's made good progress. Um, we're not complacent about it by any stretch. You know, it's not hard, Sheila, because it is absolutely embedded across the organization. And by this, I mean staff and council. I, I think I can speak truthfully when I say everybody in the organization has this as a core concern of theirs. 
Um, so there is real desire to change, you know, and there's there's a feeling that every day you get up, you can actually implement change. And look, as everybody knows, we have significantly increased funding. So, you know, that's yeah. obviously going to be an enormous help. But all our discussions with our own department, of course, but across government are about how can we make this a more diverse and inclusive landscape? So. Look, there's loads to be done. We're not, we don't have our heads in the sand about it. There's an enormous hill to climb here, but there's a super will to do so. Oh, it's fantastic. It's great to hear. Thanks a million, Maureen. Sandrine. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, so just to start off, I just want to carry on like with what Maureen was saying um, and how in Ireland we're at such an, uh, an exciting time. I think 2020 was like that cultural shift that we really needed in regards to discussion of different social issues. So I just say this in regards to BLM. I think when BLM happened, it like reignited this flame within black creatives to kind of take shape of their own narrative. And I say this in regards to the theory that I use for my PhD on Afrofuturism, like where black creativity is center of it and black people are they're centering themselves and creating a new future, which kind of departs from them being viewed as helpless victims, so which we've seen in slavery, colonialism, and things are still perpetuated on screen. So like whenever, if you think about it, like in the last year, the only time you see black people on TV is talking about racism. So it's kind of like creating this new world where it's like, no, like we want black people to be talking about different things. Like, have you ever logged on to RT and seen a black person talk about cooking or flowers and something like that. So it's kind of like reimagining that. And I think for myself, like, because I'm only just a newbie here. So like, I'm even honored to be like invited to this, like it reignited that sense of what does it mean to kind of capture these voices who have been on the fringe of society and have been made feel like they're not Irish because traditionally speaking like Irishness has always been equated to whiteness because it's been traced back to to be Irish meant to be um white Catholic and um heterosexual so like all of that has changed we've seen that with repeal the eighth um, referendum and everything like that so we are at that changing nature of Irishness and people are starting to explore what that means but as Maureen said it has to be reflective now on our screen like we have to be able to turn on the TV and see this multicultural element. And I think that's what like has been a very inspiring thing as going from writing to starting in this new creative. So when we did on silencing, I did it with my friends, um, Alison Byrne and Catherine Osakoya. And with that, we really wanted to humanize the sense of racism. So as I stated, like before, like racism is always seen as something that is statistical or like something that's up for debate where, but then through the power of narrative, you get to hear people's lived experiences. And with that, you can't deny it. And with that, like we went with a sense of unsilencing because the Afro-Irish population in Ireland, they've been here as far back as the Celtic Tigers in the 1990s and the huge migration inflow, like from 2000, 2006, and that's when I would have come to Ireland. And from this day, like, I can't remember if I've ever turned on the TV and I've seen a black person on like anything on Irish TV that wasn't to do with racism. So we really wanted to take that from that lived experiences of being first generation migrants and centering ourselves in the narrative. And even though we were talking about racism, we really wanted to move away from viewing it as in a tokenistic element of just being like, okay, here's black pain, let's reproduce it. And that's why we went with unsilencing black voices because with that, it was empowering the people that we were asking to come on and detail the lived experiences. And with that, we found it like, I know myself, like it was such a healing moment because it was that connection being like, oh, me having experienced racism in Cairo, I have the same connection to someone who would have experienced it in Limerick or Longford, anything like that. So we had that shared element. And again, that came through screen. And when we did the documentary, like it started the conversation and that was what we, did, uh, we wanted to do. So there we were able to see how, as I stated, like how education and social change were able to come through the medium of film and the power of that and what that meant when people were able to trust us to 
detail their story, but they were only able to do that because they were like, you're, it's a reflection of me. So we found that they're like, again, then like when I, when, we were, when I directed it, being like, oh, as a director, like that trust because I'm from that minority group, that people were able to like tell me like their deepest secrets there and like their, deep, their deepest insecurity when it came to Irishness. So I really found I found that very profound in that regards being like these stories are out there it's just that people have to see themselves being reflected on it and be trusting to tell someone like me in that way being like them being aware that if they tell me like I'm not going to reproduce it in a tokenistic element it's going to be in an educational sense and I think with that that's where again I developed and with an apologetic which I'm doing it with Gareth Brin and Professor Margaret Harper, because even with Unapologetic, we wanted to create a multimedia platform that again, delved into these social issues, but moved beyond like the Afrofuturistic sense of blackness. I wanted to include different minority voices. So especially with the traveler community, because when we're talking about racism in Ireland, again, it's yes, we're making progress, but it's only black people which are invited to the table to talk about it even though travelers have been experiencing it. So again, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing it in a tokenistic way. And by doing that is when I created an event, I would invite different traveler representatives to come in and talk about it. And again, like humanize this experience. So that's what we did with Unapologetic because our board members, again, we made sure to look at the gender balancement and that even with, with um, sexual orientation and make sure to represent trans people, traveler community, Asian, everything like that. So as I said, it mirrors the different social changes in Ireland. And I'm not going to be speaking on behalf of other um, Black people in that regard. So it's kind of making sure that through the different forms that we're doing it is to showcase how minority voices are not homogenic. Like just because I talk about racism that's experienced to, has happened to me and I've experienced it, doesn't mean it's the exact same for another black person. So by doing that, it's creating all these different multimedia platforms. And I think that's why I'm like, I just dabble in absolutely everything right now when it comes to being creative to just kind of showcase that change of being like, you need to have more diverse voices. And I'm in a privileged position because like, I've had these opportunities and even to be invited today to showcase that, but I know there's other people with film students, anything like that, who are black creatives who have been doing this for such a long time and haven't had the opportunity for that. And I've just been lucky just in regards to like, I came into this when BLM was happening and I'm just a very vocal person. And just like in regards to the future, there's that sense of, there's, as I stated, like there's minority voices who have lived in the fringe of society and who are made feel like their voice doesn't matter. And, but if you were to talk to them, they have stories through different, like whether it is through writing, through artistic expression, through film. But again, they just need that support. They need someone to be like, they believe in that story, but then they're not going to exploit their pain or exploit their narrative. So I think that is why, like whenever it comes to different minority funding it's so important for for that information to go to these um to these vulnerable groups and ha have it as a sense of empowerment and not as a sense of okay so we have a black person on screen or we have a mixed race person on screen like we've done our bit that's it it's how to be proactive about that and making sure that as I said people are feeling empowered when they're looking at the screen and if you're turning on tuning in and you're watching a black person on RTE it's through an educational platform and it's not through like that projection of oh here they come again to just talk about race so I think that's what like I'm really trying to change in this creative realm and that's what we're doing with um, the visual Carlo within our new documentary looking at what does Irishness mean and what does it look like but especially just from a very um, small local setting because like when I moved to Carlo like in 2006 like I think there was two or three black families that's it and even with that it was like we were all grouped together like there was no there wasn't even a need to be like oh, okay so you could be Nigerian you're Rondis that's different it's like nope you're black so you all experience the same thing so I think it's a very humbling position now to be going back home and doing a documentary on the different 
minority groups and especially including travelers in that and having that conversation like what does it mean to be Irish what does it look especially then like in a small town to again to continuously showcase how diversity is a gift and it's going to be as a, like as we did with on um, silencing black voices yes it'll anger some people because they don't really want to be confronted with the different social attitudes that are changing in Ireland and how Irishness doesn't mean to be whiteness but like that's the power of film and that's the power of narration to just change people's perspective and just to kind of give them a taste of what the future of Ireland looks like and the future of that is um, multiculturalism so yeah thank you that's terrific Sandrine um a, a lots there to think about can I just ask you have you had a good response to unapologetic I mean the unapologetic is is now broadening as you said it's broadening the whole base of the kind of areas that you're looking at and that you're you're taking leadership and giving platform to and uh, uh, is the response building up? Is it yeah, no, yeah, we're getting a good response. And it's kind of, as I stated, like we've had people being like, it's so nice as a young migrant to just know that there's a space for me um, to just kind of feel like my voice is heard. And I think that was the main element of why I set it up because like I'm a young PhD researcher, but then I'm also like a young black woman growing up in Ireland where I wanted to take theory and my lived experiences and write about both without having to be like, no, you're a migrant. So just write about the migrant experience. So, but I think like, as I say, like I'm lucky with just the way my parents have always brought me up. Like if you can't see something, just create it yourself. So that's why I couldn't see that platform. So I've created it myself. But as I say, not everyone is in that position to create these mediums and know that they'll get the support. So that's why I kind of like with Unapologetic, we just wanted to be a springboard then so then like I don't know like if someone was to become a famous writer or a famous poet uh, at the end of it like we'll know that we provided that space for them when they were like exploring what it means to be Irish um at the very start yeah it's, it's fantastic yeah it's a very brilliant brilliant initiative thanks a million um Leslie Leslie we move on to you Hi That's Sheila, thanks yeah. very much and thanks Neva and Francis. Uh, Sandrine, I can't wait to see the documentary. I see Francis just shared the link there. So uh, just already feeling very excited and inspired by what you're saying and what Maureen has been saying. Um, so I suppose personally, I've, I've worked with Screen Ireland. Prior to that, uh, I was a producer and one of the founding members of Women in Film. And I suppose at those early days, um, you know, of Women in Film, um, there, we, we were quite influenced also by the Gina Davis Institute and I suppose a lot of that thinking kind of c came in when I, you know, uh, when I started in Screen Ireland, um, there was a big emphasis on gender and a lot of that thinking kind of, I think, um, you know, bore, bore fruit. I suppose also from a personal perspective, I had produced a film called um, with Simon Fitz, the late director Simon Fitzmaurice, who was completely paralysed. And I suppose from, from a personal perspective in the EDI, area now I, I suppose I'm particularly interested in, in areas around disability as well and, and what, what we can do there and um, so I was going to share the screen with just a few slides um, but I suppose I thought it might be good to just do a very quick look back on gender now the reason for doing that is kind of in a way because I think the thinking and the pathway we kind of used on, 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 on the issues around gender is kind of similar in, in a pathway that's informing how we might look at equality, diversity and inclusion now, and also to see how the measures have worked and whether those measures and those ideas are uh, transposable, if you like, or applicable to EDI. And, and I know bearing in mind that diversity, you know, if we look at the nine areas of legislation, it's a very, very multifaceted uh, area. And those nine areas don't even include the socioeconomic aspect, which we would see as, a, as absolutely an issue uh, as well. So, so each of those areas are going to need their own kind of thinking, I, I, I believe, um, and, and bespoke. But at the same time, is there is there a general thinking and a general approach um, that we can learn from with what happens with gender that we could um, apply? So let's see if this... Did that work? Great. <laughs> I'm not good on the technology. So, um, so I suppose just in terms of uh, changing mindsets, and I know we probably get into this idea uh, in detail later, but I suppose with gender, there was the recognition of the issue 
and the demand for change and then how do you make it part of the cultural DNA. So I suppose I think we were very influenced from abroad on the gender issue like Bechdel tests and the work of the Gina Davis Institute. I think they all they all kind of played a part in people recognizing um, that, that we had an issue. I, I think you need a degree of outrage in any area to really galvanize uh, the troops. And I, and I think in an Irish context, waking the feminists was hugely significant there as a touchstone for us in Ireland uh, um, around this issue. So I, I think there was that, that recognition, you know, um, but then there was the, was, was, was how do you, how do you, and the demand for change, I suppose, leading into the demand for change. But then I suppose, how do you, how do you make change happen? Uh, and in a way, I think then it, it becomes around, a, you know, a statement of intent, intent, articulating what you want to do um, and having a plan. Now in Screen Ireland's, uh, context there there was that kind of statement in this six point plan that was there at the end of 2015 I think it was so at least there then there's an articulation of okay this is where we want to get to um, and with that the other aspect I think was significant was was around messaging because at the same time you need people to be able to hold on to some clear ideas that really really resonate and and stand firm and i think um 50 50 by 2020 was a great rallying call um we didn't achieve, we know we didn't quite achieve that but we but we we have gone a long way towards it and we're going to keep going but it was a great marker you know and it was just so clear and simple that's where we want to get to and i think that was really really helpful kind of challenge um, I don't know what they'll be for different aspects of our diversity yet. I think there are messages out there, but I just think it's a good thing to keep in mind. The other one, and I, and I know it was the title of the talk last week, is if she can see it, she can be it. You know, still wonderful and holds true now as much as it did then. I, I don't, you know, and you'd almost want to go, if we can see it, we can be it. You, you, you know, in, in terms of representations, this idea of representation on screen, which is so, um important and um so so i suppose when we're talking when we were talking about gender we were talking about change of representations on screen which i know is a huge amount of what um gina davis institute was focusing on and also who's working behind the screen um in terms of changing the cultural mindset to go back to that bit i suppose what we also recognized as key was was data and again i think we did learn that from the gina davis studies because you might feel something anecdotally to be true and you you know you'd probably be right um but actually it's different to when you're faced with the stark statistics and actually the statistics can be worse than you thought the situation was, you know, and, and particularly around the work they did around representation, sexualization of younger characters on screen in family films, all of that, all of that stuff was kind of shocking. And the one I remember struck me hugely was, you know, that 17% of crowd scenes had women in them, you know, given that women are 51% of the American population and a lot of populations. So, so those kind of, um, that kind of data and analysis, um, I think, was very useful, and we was doing that here at that moment in time with all the institutions and with the AI and Screen Ireland and RT. Everybody started looking at the data, and of course, the data was very depressing. Um, so, um, particularly in you know in relation to writing and directing. So, I would say we then tried to decide what were we going to do about it. So. Um, we came in with a number of different uh, initiatives. Um, there was a couple that were key. I suppose one was one called the, fe was the Female Uplift, which was where we gave additional money to projects, whether it was documentary or feature film, that had female writer directors attached. Because I suppose we recognized that even though production company wise, there was a proportion, there was a good proportion of female producers. It was still probably two thirds, one thirds, or a little bit more. Um, and so therefore we wanted to incentivize producers to go looking for the talent. And we felt that if we incentivize them with the monetary reward to their budget, that that would help. And I would say that has actually helped and has pushed things and has pushed more projects through and has pushed producers to look in, in, in different um, directions. We also did a scheme called, we repurposed a scheme called Catalyst. It was a kind of a low budget initiative for feature films and we called it POV 
where the target was writers and directors, female writers and directors. Two of them are in post-production now. They, they took a bit of time, um, partly COVID there as well, but um, two of them are in post-production. One is about to shoot in two weeks and one will shoot later this year. Um, and there was also an emphasis on, on short films and balancing that as well. Um, and so we also started to track in every single round, whether it was development or production, we started to track how many women have applied. And, and that just raises your consciousness as you're making decisions, uh, apart from anything else in a kind of an organic way, but also it allows us to kind of track, track the progress as it went along. So I suppose, how is it going, you know, four years in really from a lot of these um, initiatives and uh, we, we have had a growth in applications from female filmmakers. And I, I suppose it's true to say we did end up honing in on something here, which was writing and directing and storytelling, if you like. So we didn't necessarily go through all the issues around representation, you know, in terms of, you know, DOPs or heads of department in different areas. We, we, we did quite deliberately focus on, on, on writing and directing at this point. But there was a growth and an increase in, in um, films being produced with female talent attached. There's been some major awards, festivals and critical acclaim for those films. Um, Claire Dunn recently winning screenplay at the IFTAS. There's been, there's been a lot of you know, success with that, um, which I suppose given there was you know, skepticism early on of, oh, somehow we were going to be rewarding you know, less talented people or, you know, there was this kind of worry that somehow it wouldn't be about quality when it's quality is absolutely there. Um, so it's, it's not about tokenism in any shape or form. Um, and then just uh, the short films worked extremely well and we have had parity uh, over a number of years um, in terms of the directing and writing talent. And I suppose that is key as well because the short filmmakers are the future. So you're kind of building in all the time that, that, that the numbers are going to be stronger. Now, I, I think we always have to remain vigilant, but, um, but, but things did, did improve. So just a couple of stats from 2019, uh, female directors, 37% of all funded projects, writers, 43% of all um, funded projects. And, and we had an increase from 10% to 27% um, from where we were. Sometimes there's dips and flows and things go up and down on different application rounds. Um, but, but overall, there has, there has been an increase and we really want to obviously get to 50-50. We're not, we, we're not giving up on, on that. Um, so just, just that's basically the same stuff there, what I've been talking about in terms of, um, yes, the spotlight scheme achieved 50-50. Um, we did the ex-pollinator or, or co-funded it. Um, and the director's concept, that was a recent scheme from last year, 52% of the su successful applicants were from female directors. Um, Screen Skills, that's our sister organization with Screen Ireland, obviously, um, done a huge amount in this area um, and, and have very much focused as well on who, who's attending their courses, who's coming in to, to, the, to this area. Uh, and there's been a huge amount of work done in mentoring again, very successful and shadow directing and uh, trying to bring, bring more women uh, at entry level into the industry. First three awards, the actor is creator, had gender equality and obviously section 481, it's kind of built into this um, uh, as well. Um, and just there, just the directors and writers from the POV scheme. So we're very excited about that um, and just, I'll stop sharing. Just one other note, actually, that I didn't put in the slides, but one of the things we recognised we needed to do was collaborations with fellow funders. So um, we obviously have worked with um, BAI and Cine Cahar on, um, uh, on, and TG Cahar on the Cine Cahar Irish language feature film initiative, but one of those rounds was for female writer and directors only. So it's kind of little different incentives all the time. You're trying to think of what you can do. There's a Luxembourg Ireland co-development fund for female filmmakers. We collaborated with Creative BC in Canada and a funding partnership for development with female talent. Um, uh, and yeah, that, that's kind of probably it. I mean, representations on screen, I suppose, is a more organic thing, but I would say as a project manager sitting in front of writers and directors, 
it's been my constant job and 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 happy to do it to question representations of female characters you know why did they have to be this way or that way and also or you know one feature film i remember there was nine male characters and i was going why can't there be women he he changed the two of them to women it was great for the script it all worked very well so and that was a real thing around the gina davis institute was to really challenge and question why and can you change and can you do it differently and can you you know have have stronger female characters um so i realize obviously that that is very much in the in the gender uh debate which is ongoing but i suppose in terms of our thinking we are applying that as well you know in terms of data in terms of representation in terms of how to encourage people in how to mentor how to have incentives i think that's all part of our thinking at the moment and and just in terms of we have a new board and we have just a newly appointed um equality diversity and inclusion subcommittee which is being headed up by marion quinn and dr zelia sava so so that's great that's that's um, newly appointed we also as an organization have been working for the last number of months and will continue to do so with Adaku Ezuodo of Phoenix Rise Consulting and she's working with us on our policy and strategy. We are about, we're on the cusp of having a new strategic uh, review or uh, published or strategy published in a couple of months time which will be a three-year strategy and so diversity and inclusion will be very much at the heart of that and so that's why the, the notion around what our statement of intent is and what the strategy is and what we're hoping to do we haven't kind of come out of the traps with that yet but it, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes on all of that um we also have an internal policy group within the organization and just to chime with what maureen is saying we've we've different internal they're like think tanks within screen ireland and screen skills looking at different areas the biggest out um you know, response was was for EDI. Actually, there's a huge commitment. There's a huge passion to to really uh, deliver this. We are and have been for the last more than a year and a half now. We're tra tracking the same way we did for gender. We're tracking any diverse elements um, from applicants um, in content in any in in all the development and production rounds to be sure that we are conscious of what's. Um, coming in and the last iteration of our spotlight scheme for new writers had a clear goal around diversity and inclusion as did the virgin media shorts and and there was great diversity there screen skills have run uh, numerous courses in diversity and inclusion training which is key to us as well is training around it's like unconscious bias from you know but in a slightly new context we're very conscious that that needs to happen um, and we're looking to see how we can gather more diverse uh, diversity and inclusion information on our crew base going forward and also on everybody who um, applies, applies to us. Um, and as chiming in what Maureen was saying as well, this is about us all working together and it's about us working with the industry and the people we fund. So again, written into what we're doing going forward will be um, a commitment to the people we fund, whether it's from Section 41 or for Screen Ireland, that they have diversity and inclusion is central to their thinking and their projects as well. Um, I mean, I think there's, I'm just really excited about the possibilities going forward. We have to um, represent Ireland as it exists today. We haven't been doing that adequately on screen. So we need to do that and we need to be careful about those representations and just listening to what Sandrine was saying. But we also need to increase our crew. There's huge opportunities in terms of incoming videos and different um, people coming into Ireland to work here. And we need to up our crew levels and, and actually writing, producing, directing, acting, tricky careers, we know, you know, sometimes to earn a living in. But but in, I would argue that, you know, working as crew members in, in, in so many diverse roles in film, there is something for everybody in there. And and actually, it, it's long hours, it's tough, but but actually you can earn a living. So I feel this, we, we need to be looking at all these different groups and saying, please come and work in the film industry, because I think genuinely we need to increase our increase our crew numbers and there are opportunities there but we have to at the same time provide that as a welcoming environment and we're conscious of that too and that's where that diversity and inclusion yeah. training is going to come in with the people who are there already anyway sorry i'm sorry i've gone beyond the five minutes there so. 
No, oh, Leslie, it's, it's very, thank you very much. Um, and I, I, there are a lot of questions coming in and I hope some of them, we're not going to have a chance to, we've got a lot more to talk about, not least Stephanie, come to which we'll in a moment. I just hope that some, maybe some of the things you have said might have partially answered some of the questions. We're not going to get through everything, but it's like, it's very, it, the one of education, skills, training, you know, how we work together. These are all really, really important issues. Um, Stephanie, over to you. Thanks very much, Sheila, and uh, thank you for having me today. Um, it's really lovely to come uh, at the end, actually, uh, because I'm, I'm really inspired by everything I've heard from Maureen, Sandrine and Leslie. So, uh, so thanks very much for that. I suppose I wanted to, I'm very conscious of time and we do want to get to questions. So I, I'm going to try, and it's always a challenge for me not to talk too much, um, but uh, going into the things that we have done in the gender and diversity and inclusion space um, uh, from a BI perspective and you know I'm not going to touch on everything but it, it's quite broad ranging you know uh, so for example like the BI is in, uh, uh, included um, diversity on uh, or sorry gender equality on boards for community broadcasters for over 25 years now so like before we started talking about this there was already clauses that required community broadcasters to have gender equal boards uh, so, so like we, we've been working for a long time in that space the thing is and you, we can come to that uh, at some stage there is a lot more to do and there's there's no question about that and it's really you know important that we have those conversations and that we talk uh, about it a little bit like you know what leslie uh, was talking about you know the bai also kind of got very much around um the 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 gender equality gender diversity on uh, on film on screen and on projects that we fund through our sound and vision uh, fund so in 2018 we launched our gender action plan and really there were four pillars in there <clears throat> Um, there was the sound and vision uh, data collection. Uh, Leslie has talked about data. I think Sandrine talked about data earlier on as well. It's important to have a sense of that. We found that the data was um, not good at all uh, uh, in terms of the key creative roles. Um, and so we decided to ask questions for projects that we were going to fund. Um, and then once those those applications came in and we had some uh, useful gender data. We also use uh, gender as a strategic criterion so that applications with women in key creative roles would be given additional uh, points, if you like, in the scoring process for sound and vision funding. Um, so what we found and one of the things that has worked quite well, and I think helps us build different and better uh, outcomes for for, for minorities and for other uh, groups that we do want to represent and to portray on screen is that asking the question changes the behavior. So if you start asking people who want your money <laughs> uh, what you're going to do with it and who is going to get an element of it, we find that that changes the behavior uh, because then there is a, an awareness act, uh, or an awakening of awareness at least where you kind of go oh yeah I have to think as an applicant for funding I have to think about those things and they're important things um, so we have seen by just asking the question we've seen a huge you know quantifiable increases uh, near parity near 50 50 in terms of the allocation of um, funding for creative roles at um, uh, at a uh, writer, producer, director and actor level. Um, editor as well are doing very well. We know we're weak on the director of photography, something we're working on. Uh, that is not necessarily addressing all of the issues though in terms of uh, equality by far. So there's a number of other things that we have done. Uh, one of the things was the, the women's stories round with, um, with a Sound and Vision, where we said that we would particularly look for 
stories about women that didn't necessarily have to be made by women, though of course that would give you extra points, uh, but they certainly had to tell women's stories. And the idea about that was to kind of change the narrative. If all of a sudden on screen or on the radio, you start hearing a lot of women's stories, you start hearing perspective that you haven't heard before. And we find that that's something that has worked quite well for us. We, here in the BAI, you know, we've written limited resources like everybody else has limited resources. So we try to work very hard with partners and we find that we have worked with key partners in terms of uh, gender diversity, uh, women in film and television, women on air. Um, we've also funded the Cross Pollinator uh, initiative that Leslie was talking about earlier on. And, and these things allow us to really um, get kind of close down, work with expert partners on the ground that can deliver things that we can't deliver um, and, 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 and stimulate those conversations and those debates and also change and impact on, on, on change in a positive way. Um, I saw, I think Susan Liddy, uh, who's in the audience, talked about the changes that Anna Cerner at the Swedish Film Institute had, uh, had instigated. And I think that that is a hundred percent, a hundred and fifty percent true. Like the work that Anna Cerner had done in Sweden has really impacted, I think, across Europe, certainly in Ireland, but every everywhere else in terms of asking questions about, you know, follow the money. If you ask questions and you make funding conditional, you will see a change of behaviours. And, and we, we definitely have seen that. Um, so that's kind of where we are um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, of our funding work uh, but there's other things that we do as well and that we've done for a number of um uh, of years a vast number of years um you know sound and vision projects have to be provided with either subtitling or um uh, irish sign language or audio description um, um uh, capacity for uh I suppose to increase access to people who may not be uh, able to, um, to follow them otherwise. That's a really important way of increasing the access of the material that we fund, uh, those really great Irish stories that we fund in a way that makes it just more accessible. Uh, we've worked with the National Disability Authorities in the past and, and on an ongoing basis as well about you know, increasing access, not just for the deaf and hard of hearing community, but for uh, or the blind communities, but also for other communities uh, who you know have um, uh, access issues, and that we need to to promote. Is there more work that can be done in there? A hundred percent. Some Sandrine, I think, mentioned. Um, uh, the, the traveler community earlier on uh, we've also tried to and you know uh, it, it all depends on what kind of applications we get but we have funded documentaries about you know that, that try to portray traveling community in a positive light because we know that that's not always uh, the case and uh, radio has been an effective way of, of doing that um, and and uh, providing really good um uh, documentaries and recording, I suppose, of stories uh, from the from the traveler community uh, there. And like I didn't know uh, in my uh, in my shameful ignorance that there, there was a travel language, and we actually funded a, a documentary about a travel language a number of years ago, which is amazing. Uh, Cant language, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, what else do we do? We do research. Uh, we're launching a, um, a research report on auditing gender and diversity change in Irish media sectors. Uh, we're doing that uh, next week. I'm sorry for plugging it, but I, I feel I need to. Uh, a team from uh, Maynooth University, uh, University of Limerick and uh, UCD uh, have worked on that and it's a really important report that kind of captures the behaviour of broadcasters and what they are doing in that space. So we need to be asking those questions and, and that's what the report will capture. Uh, we've also a research report that will be launched uh, later in the summer on diversity and inclusion and meeting public needs. Um, and that is a collaboration between DCU and OTE funded by the BAI. Um, we're currently reviewing our gender action plan and part of that work is to identify gaps. And we know they are gaps and we're not, you know, we, we want to address those and to plug those. Um, but if I look at the things that we have done, the things that we feel have worked 
well and the things that we are planning, I probably need to talk briefly about the things that we haven't done yet and what we want to uh, to to uh, invest time and effort and funding in. Uh, and that to, is to continue, I suppose, our, our data collection work, but on a much broader platform. Uh, so we're looking at the moment at looking at a, a data collection framework that would be looking at diversity and inclusion on a much broader basis than gender, which is what we have done so far. Um, we don't feel we can do that on our own. Um, so that's why we've been talking to Leslie McKeem and uh, our colleagues in Screen Ireland and looking at what we can do in partnership together. And Maureen, I'm, I'm sorry to say your name was mentioned and we haven't come to you yet, but um, fear not, we're on our way. <laughs> because we do think that it's important to have consistency as well across um, across creative communities uh, in, in the entire island uh, of Ireland, if we can, you know, and, and we can work with broadcasters, we can work with funders, uh, and we can work with um, any supporting agencies for the for, 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 um, creative um, works in Ireland. And God knows that that's an area where Ireland is really strong. Uh, so we, we, we should definitely try to deliver some consistency there we think that that's really important um, we're also planning to do some um as with the data collection framework is to feed into a broader uh, diversity and inclusion strategy for the bai and that will be coming um down the tracks at some stage um once we've completed our review of the gender action plan and once we've put into place a data collection framework that works. We're also thinking about targeted sound and vision rounds for underrepresented voices. I think that's something that is, it's a really quick win in many ways. Um, and it means that it, it facilitates in many ways the independent production sector in Ireland to look at those and to, try and to start um, telling stories that we, we just haven't heard before. And Ireland works, we're very good at storytelling in Ireland. It's one of our key skills. We export it uh, even. We, we love that. That's how we affect change as well in, in Ireland. Things like, you know, the, um, uh, the Eighth Amendment or the marriage equality referendum have been um, brought about by the telling of stories. So societal change is moved by stories in, in Ireland particularly. I'm sure that's true every everywhere but looking at it in Ireland that's very much uh, important so looking at telling those stories and portraying those stories on on air on screen means that we can deepen I suppose the societal change that we need um, and then you know in a similar way that we have introduced gender as a strategic criteria we we're definitely looking at um, uh, introducing a strategic criteria for underrepresented voices and communities as well as part of our sound and vision funding people would be told it's not something that we're going to do um, necessarily overnight but it's certainly something that we need to uh, to, to work on in a, you know in a cohesive way so I'm going to stop now because I've talked too much already it's, you know there's so much in all of what you, what all of you have said there really is there's so much there's so much uh, so many different initiatives um there is one question that I just want to come back immediately and then we talk on and it is a question regarding when discussing because it's just a, a good one when discussing disability it strikes us from Dorothy Leahy it strikes that the majority of the conversation is couched in a future tense, and I'm intrigued as to why that is. Is it that the expectation that those of us who are established in our careers will also peripherally benefit from new measures? Or is it that there's an assumption of passing as non-disabled for those of us who are established and working rather than meeting the helpless starting out? Not sure where to go without the guidance trope. So easy to buy into the latter, especially with the cognitive dissonance of the lived experience of being an established professional attempting to continue to work equally on a daily basis. I mean, it is it is an interesting one about about the present. Are we drawing a line? Any Maureen or have any of you, Leslie, got just a quick response to that? Sure. Yeah. No. No. I think that that's an excellent point. And I mean, I think it is about starting at at a young age and you know redrawing the the um, going back to the drawing board, you know, and saying absolutely what are the supports that are needed so that people can feel they have access to the Arts Council or the other funding agencies. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I absolutely understand the point, but I understand, I think, the, the urgency to 
to start at the beginning again, to start afresh and say, how, how absolutely can we make sure this is the most open landscape ever? Um, recently, I was speaking at a council meeting and I talked about hard to reach communities and I was very correctly um, corrected by, by one of our council members who said, you know, maybe we should start thinking that we're the ones hard to reach. And I was like, Jesus, yeah, of course. Like that's a switch that is absolutely flicked in my head, you know. So I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm, I'm not addressing that that person whose, whose name I've forgotten I mean, correctly, maybe. But I sense from what you're saying that, it, like, that that there there is both. We are both. Um, I mean, this is the difficult thing that we're not all gathered in the IFI. It would be much nicer, Dorothy, if you were to, to talk to you directly or for you to talk directly to the panel. But I think in in this sense, what we're also saying is that there there these new initiatives had to be done. And so there are a lot of people who have struggled, there's a lot of people from all kinds of minorities who have struggled to get into a position where they are working professionals, despite the challenges that they have individually carried. Mm -hmm. But th these funds and whatever will also be available to them. I mean, there's no, this is actually something we are now trying to open ourselves out to embrace new people as well as consolidate the position as it is and move forward. I think I'm right in saying that. I mean, there's also quite a few questions about training. How do you get entry into the uh, industry? How can we, you know, where can we, how can we bring people in? And also, you know, how can people get in? How can they get training? And also uh, one about as a freelancer, when you're dealing with racism, where do you go to? Yeah. You know, because the freelance, it's it's very difficult. I mean, it's Leslie. Do you have is there anything you? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It is something we're absolutely um, looking at because I think there's like been lots around bullying and and bullying in the workplace and and kind of charters around that. But I don't think there's been enough yet on on racism. What you do um, if you do have a specific complaint? I think the theatre world are ahead of us in 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 that regard um but and i suppose it goes back to we want it to be a welcoming environment if we are encouraging people to come into this industry and we don't want them to have bad experiences then as a, as a result so so you know that's about training on the one side for the people who are already in the industry and and on the other hand it's about having mechanisms that if people are experiencing whether it's from a microaggression level you know what what level it's at um that's unacceptable that there is uh, a forum where they can you know, bring that to. So that is something we're, we're looking at. It's an important point to highlight because, you know, where people are lucky enough to be supported by an organisation that actually has adequate bullying and harassment policies and inclusion mm -hmm. policies in place, well, then they're lucky. But when somebody is freelance, as so much as the film and the creative arts is, it's freelance, yeah. it's people working away on their own and then having to deal individually with the challenges that they're faced. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, maybe for all of us to take away from this is what structures. Yes, Maureen? And Sheila, can I just mention maybe an immediate practical support that's there for people is Minding Creative Minds, which is, is a very good service that is currently supported by the department. So they have a range of services, very practical, legal, financial, but also counselling and lots of, lots of guidance. So it might be a good place for people to go right now. But I think, look, because the, the nature of the sector is so much built on, on the fragile freelance sector, that that's, that's an area that, that we're certainly going to look at in the near future. Stephanie? Yeah, just to kind of echo what Maureen says, we have funded last year the provision of a service for musicians, actually, um, which also uh, happened to be a freelance, which was a, a mental health support. So it could be about, you know, having experience, negative experiences in the sector or having personal mental health issues. Uh, but we funded that. But I, I, I have to say there really is a need for, you know, again, cohesive, general shared kind of thinking on that because that's the only way you get to change things and stephanie is that still active and do you want yes to i believe it's still active we, we just provided funding for the establishment of it so just a, a, a small but that platform is still and i can't find the name now and my colleague uh Finula will have known this but she's not here but okay. i can get back to you on that uh, and i can definitely uh, uh share it it yeah. was a small initiative and it was specifically for musicians who obviously 
obviously at the beginning of the pandemic were the first affected really uh, by by the, uh, the the lockdown orders and and the fact that you know their livelihood just disappeared under them. Um, so yeah. so we tried to uh, we tried to do something about that. Um, but but I think more generally there is a need to to work on that cohesively. Yeah. Um, can I just ask a couple of quick questions and then we'll come back to the questions that have come in. Very quick answers. Central place for data. Are agencies working together to share data and assess strategies and policies? I mean, you've all mentioned lots of wonderful research. There's a short answer. Are you working together? Or, not you, but is, are, are we collectively? We are starting to, I would say. You know, and and, and um, because there is a danger, there's lots of activity happening in different areas and lots of enthusiasm and, and we don't want to double up either, you know, yeah. like let's say if we're to take on representations on screen mm. and what's happened, as, that's a huge body of work and I, I noticed Marion or Donano brought it up in, in the talk last week, you know, who does that, you know, so and we're looking at a crew database, you know, in terms of capturing crew, capturing trajectories and improvements in crew. Um, so yes, we yeah. are we are starting to talk to each other. That was a long answer, Sheila. So next yeah. question. Oh, so it, does, our next question is going to ask, are additional resources and extra funding required to adequately address and implement human equality, human rights and diversity strategies? I mean, it strikes me that, it strikes me that like there is a lot of work involved. Are there funds available for people doing this work or is extra funding, or are you expected to do it within your daily work as part of your daily work? Just curious. Um, there's a sorry. There's a partner question with that, and I'll just ask: Are you getting? Are you happy with the leadership coming from other areas, such as the Department of Education? Is there education in schools? So it's it's just generally the connection between the creative industries and the broader systems that apply that offer money funding. Can I jump in? Um, uh, yes, more money is needed, of course, and we're really aware that when we're saying to our 150 strategically funded organisations, please pay attention to our equality, human rights and diversity policy, that they might think that's all very fine and well, but I still have my core staff of four, how am I going to reach on this, that this is not something that they think about it on Friday at five o'clock when everything else that's so urgent and pressing is done in the week, you know, so that is something we're absolutely focused on this year is how do we equip these organizations because they're the ones who deliver it for us you know it's all very well us us with our with our policies but if on the ground if we can't seed people and support them on the ground to do that and um, in terms of education we run the creative schools program which is a now very um quickly growing program and we are just this in, in a few weeks time in fact my colleague Catherine Boothman will be delivering training in equality and diversity for our creative associates there so we're really conscious of the need of how do we embed that on the ground um, and it is it is about us all working cross cross sectorally across departments that, that we're really going to press this home yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just, I absolutely agree. I, um, so, you know, funding and leadership is always needed. Okay, that's more, more resources, more funding, always, always needed. But I think what's needed as well, and, and going back to what Leslie was saying earlier on, is us kind of working together so that actually we can maximize what we're offering and what we're uh, doing and how we're monitoring situations and what kind of questions we're asking. I think that that's also quite important. Um, and, and I guess, you know, uh, when Leslie was saying, you, you, we started to that conversation we we have because we recognize that you know we have a, a role to play um in, in this so um you know i'm going to give you a good public service answer there on that uh, yeah I, I you know i can't say I, I can't put a number on it i can't put but i know there are ways that we can work together and that's that's definitely the the, the, the easiest thing to do in the short term i think it, it kind of seems so wasteful when you know reports after reports and consultants and you know are are being are being produced and if you know if they're if or where they are not been brought together. Um, there's a number of questions about uh, standards in the industry and the length of days. It is are you just working towards changing ideas or are you working at actually changing? Um, you know, means of access. I think means of access you've already referred to, but we're also things like long days, you know, working environment. Has any, is that part of the thinking? 
Yes, I suppose there's probably a couple of there's a couple of aspects to that. I mean, in terms of what we talked about earlier around mental health, you know, there was a huge study in the UK which hasn't been replicated here, but it, but it it had some very grave kind of um, findings around uh, mental health for people working in the industry. So you know, we can assume there's that aspect. So I suppose we're we're kind of conscious of of looking at that. Then in terms of the working environment and improving it, it is something we're looking at. I suppose in, in another small kind of uh, initiative, you know. In terms of women with families and um, raising films have just been given 25,000 in funding from screen uh, the screen skill stakeholder funding to look at childcare issues within the film industry and on film sets so so that's something we've been talking about doing for a while and are really keen to address so there's lots of different aspects within that the working day or what, what you know so so but that that was one was was childcare but there are other aspects that are being discussed yeah. in that. um Sandrine, I'm curious about, uh, have you got a response to what you're hearing? Because you're, as a practitioner on the level who is actually using these agencies and also connecting through your, your film and, and your work in Visual Carlo, um, have you got a response? And I'd also love to hear what your definition of quality is and good work, because it's all, you know, do you, what would you consider Good yeah, um, yeah, no, just in regards to the conversation, especially with the data collection, I think it kind of goes into effect. It's like, who are you asking the questions to? Because a lot of the times, I think that's what, like, with unapologetic, it is like where, again, like these all grand ideals of like social change, they're being made by people which are not being affected by it, like directly by it. So, like, you do miss the mark. And that's why report after report comes in and people from minority backgrounds are able to see the gaps because it's like you didn't ask me for that like and if you're talking about so even when we're talking about um racism as a freelancer and it's like oh bullying but like racism and bullying are completely different things and like as I say like you wouldn't know unless you ask people which are experiencing them it's like very very different so I think in that like we're just what I'm listening to like in regards to the data collection it's just really important to ask the people which are on the ground and to ask these diverse groups that you're trying to cater to because as I say it's not a homogenic thing like what works for one artist or filmmaker is not going to work for everyone else and I think that's where it's been the issue and that's why it's taken this long to start addressing these issues on screen because like a lot of the times that we're having these conversations about like oh diversity in Ireland it's oh do you know it's just a new thing like it's multiculturalism is just new but as I stated earlier in my talk like 1990s and 2000 like and we still haven't done anything for it like there's still there's that sense of frustration and as I stated the frustration is there because the people on the ground or the minority are not being asked so it's kind of like as I'm saying like I had to go out and do that documentary myself to be like I want to see racism being presented in this manner not in a tokenistic way but as I stated I'm only new to this so I can only imagine other filmmakers or anything like that so I think like whenever it does come to like defining quality or like diversity and anything like that it is as I say to just ask the people which are being affected because those people which are on the fringe of society and the ones which want to make their stories out there like they'll be giving new insights and ones that as I say, it will be like, oh, we just easily overlooked that because we talked to someone who's a professional in that sense. And they didn't say like that they experienced racism. Of course not, because like if they're well established, they'll be completely different from someone new who's starting out. So it's in like when organizations are communicating, as I stated, like they have to include the other people in that conversation because that's why there's reports and reports and reports and that that's why like there's that frustration from minority um, from people from minority backgrounds being like, I don't want to come in and be like the only black female, black female filmmaker because then like, how is that not tokenistic? And I don't want to come in if I know that if I do freelance and if I'm not supported, I'm going to experience racism. Because again, you're constantly having to prove yourself in regards to gender and race and class, everything there. But like if you have these open dialogues and these open conversations with multiple people from different communities and different level of their professionalism. So people which are already established as um, someone in their question in the questions had already stated versus someone who's just starting out like students or anything like that. I feel like that's where you'd get the best collection, like with uh, students which are 
studying film or anything like that because they're about to go into it so it's like what's the barriers that deters them from going into it and people with our minority backgrounds which want to go into film or tv what's the barriers that stops them into going into it and it'll be something that it's something that would have been overlooked for years but it'll be something that will be able to be solved if you just have these open dialogues and invite um filmmakers and practitioners from these backgrounds to come in and just have an open conversation of what way to move forward yeah yeah, no, that's it's and and what uh, Sandrine, social media is obviously your 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 platform for a lot of your work and the way that you you're gathering. Um, I mean, do you feel that social media has positives as well as negatives? Unfortunately, I see all the negatives. You know, not, I'm just because it's it can be very toxic. That's all. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know. I think like with the negatives we had received from it, it was like when we released the documentary and I say, as I stated, people just saw like oh, racism is just after coming out of nowhere. We're already dealing with the pandemic. Why are you bringing racism into it? And I think that was the main tagline of, un uh, of unsilencing was there's two pandemics in Ireland, COVID and racism. And people that felt like that was, again, was just because their sense of Irishness was being distilled. So of course, and they were able to just be angry on social media, but we saw that social media like connected us with the networks because I... I had like calls from different um, people like in the UK or in Scotland, which were like, oh, we're black in mm -hmm. the Scotland and we experienced the same thing. So like we were able to connect through social media and stuff like that. And I think like in social media, we are having those conversations of what Irishness is changing. As I say, like in any work that you do, you always have trolls in that, but it's just to kind of see the silver lining of that and as I stated like that's where the conversations are happening where people are asking oh what why is racism only being talked about now and you're able to provide different links to be like oh no it's always been there but again it's just important for people to come in and talk about it. It's a, it's a curious one uh, Sandrine I think with, with the the um the fact that uh, for like a lot of what we're talking about in are the mainstream media you know, broadcast media, um, film, you know, so it's big budget, big, big budget stuff. And it's quite interesting, while I'm not saying that that uh, people should be underpaid for their work, they shouldn't, they should be fully paid for the work, but th that the streaming and social media offers, I think, options to share or to connect with film and information with, with a younger generation that actually the more traditional media doesn't. I mean, I think the, the fact that Unapologetic is actually going to be an online magazine as opposed to being a printed, published, you know, is... is yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and I think we made it online because we were very hyper aware of the different minorities that we wanted to reach. So like, let's say when people in direct provision, it's not like they would have had money to buy our magazine. And if we're trying to be like, oh, Unapologetic is going to be the mirror of what you are experiencing or we're tackling these issues, then they have to have access to it. And I think that's the same thing we did with um, on Silencing Black Voices. We made it free on YouTube, even when we're sending it to universities and different schools, it's always been free. So like that's the platform of it. And it might just seem silly that you're like, oh, you're not making money off it. But like, it's not about making money. As I say, like it's about educating and opening yeah. up that dialogue. And if you're working with minority voices, they have to have access to the art that you've asked them to sacrifice their life story too so like we've we're always do that and that's why even with unapologetic when it goes um live in october it's always going to be free because as i stated we want it to be as accessible to everyone and that's the best way to do it because like as i say like if we're holding that mirror image it has yeah. to be accessible for all yeah yeah yeah, no, it's 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 so much change. I mean, it's, it's we've covered a huge number of territories, and I, I I thank you all. I haven't got to all the questions, but as a very final thing, can I just ask you, if if in in literally in two sentences each, where would you like to see the work that you're doing be in? What would you like to see in ten years' time? I mean, can we change things? Can we change things? Yeah, ten years' time. Can I start, Sheila? You can, Stephanie. Yes. I want to get to a place where we don't have those conversations. I want to get, uh, you know, I, that's the real, that's the optimum outcome is that we, we don't have to work towards diversity and inclusion because it's embedded in 
every aspect yeah. of our social lives. That's really what I'd like to see. It's just the world. It's just the world. Yeah. yeah. Morning. Yeah, <clears throat> very similar uh, a position where we don't need to be appointing people to work on diversity and inclusion for us, where we have made ourselves redundant in that regard, you know, and where absolutely everybody in Ireland understands the benefit of equality for all and where uh, people from underrepresented communities are in key decision making roles in, in many, many of them. They're no longer unrepresented, underrepresented communities. Yeah, yeah. It's, Leslie? Yeah, I mean, I'd just love to see the Ireland we live in represented on screen and properly represented on screen and behind the screen, you know, in terms of all those roles um, that, that there's a representation of the rich culture that's there. That's what I'd love to see. Yeah. Sandrine? Yeah, just to like echo what everyone is saying, as I stated, I think just the mirror image of what Ireland is, like the multicultural and just the rich heritage of different cultures and just different conversations to all just be on Ireland. So like, as I say, like turning on, I think in 10 years time is turning on RT and just seeing a black person talking about the weather or something like that, that has a thing to do with racism. I think that would be like a winning key point. That's great. Listen, thank you all very much. That was a really, really broad ranging and good conversation. Thank you for your time. Um, I uh, and thanks to everybody who has tuned in and who's listening. Thanks to everybody for your questions. They, I, I hope we managed to touch on most of them. Um, apologies if we didn't. My, my sincere apologies if we didn't. Um, it's, it's a funny format, this, this old Zoom business, and hopefully maybe next year we'll be meeting in person. Um, I just want to thank, so thank all of you and thank everybody who has tuned in, thank everybody for their contributions and questions. This will be available to um, have on the IFI Spotlight 2021 uh, um, website and back on IFI YouTube. And uh, I'll just hand over to Suniva for the final, final wrap up, but thank you, well done, it's really, interesting. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm just popping in to thank you particularly sincerely for your great steering of this uh, very varied conversation, very lively and information filled. And I'm for one, I'm relieved that it is recorded because there's you know, quite a bit to digest there. And um, I, I, over the past number of weeks, I think we've learned a lot. We've been illuminated by the various speakers and what they have to contribute. I'd particularly like to thank my colleagues in IFI to Ross Keane, the director, of course, who um, has, you know, overseen um, the, the, the development of Spotlight um, to David O'Mahony, my colleague in cinema programming. And, uh, you know, in, in our cinema program, we have been uh, very keen to um, bring learnings from Spotlight uh, to our cinema screens. So, you know, we're very, uh, we, we have much greater representations of women's work through our F-rated program, for example. And um, other colleagues um, th that are, are very key to this, um, I very particularly like to thank Alicia McGivern um, for her work in increasing accessibility for our screens. And it was she who led the uh, Access uh, Film Initiative with the Arts Council. And Alicia's work um, was rewarded um, with the Europa Cinema's Innovation Prize uh, in October, 2020. So, you know, it's, it's very gratifying that the Film Institute is working to open our doors and make uh, the, the screens uh, accessible to people with uh, disabilities. Um, the other person that I'd like to thank is the Wizard of Oz behind the screens, um, behind our screens. And over the past number of weeks, Frances Wilde, um, an underrepresented, under silenced voice, um, will become sil will become audible now. So Frances, um, none of this could have happened without her. As you all know, you've been getting uh, emails from Frances. Frances, you can unmute yourself. I, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Suniva, and just to echo. Um, your words to Alicia and our programming team and if anybody is interested in reading more about IFI accessible screenings and accessibility features in our printed material and online you can see ifi.ie slash accessible in relation to open caption screenings audio description and online on IFI at home we're working towards closed caption screenings wherever possible um, so bringing it back to that present tense conversation of what we can do now in cinema exhibition, um, our team are working really hard, so big shout out to them.
Thanks very much, Francis. And of course, uh, I would also like to thank Susan Liddy, who has been very engaged in this morning's event, but Susan really has been enormously helpful in, in constructing this whole series and, uh, you know, advising on who might be a good speaker. Um, you were all top of her list, uh, uh, but, you know, Susan, really, we, we couldn't have done this without you. So, Susan, thank you so much indeed. Okay, well, I think that's it for this series for the moment. Um, do keep your eyes peeled on IFI um, uh, on our website because you know we, we host these kinds of conversations uh, regularly. So uh, we look forward to welcoming you back again. So thank you all again. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you, team.